Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. My name is Daniel Baer, and I'm a professor at Humber College in Toronto, Canada. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, yeah, before we get started, I'll just give people a minute or two to come on in. Uh, I'm not sure how the other sessions are running on time. Uh, so just want to make sure that the um, uh, people get a chance to come on in. So we'll just give them a minute or two. If you have any questions, you can uh, put them in the chat at any time. Um, and then we will, uh, uh, I'll get them right on screen and be able to reply to you verbally. I've also joined via a participant route. So I should be able to see chats coming in that way. And if need be, uh, reply via typing. So, uh, yeah, as I said, we'll just give people uh, a couple of minutes, make sure everybody's here on time. While we're uh, waiting for folks, um, maybe if people just want to put in the chat where they're connecting from, uh, be really interesting to see a sense of where everybody's at. Um, apparently, I think there is a short delay between the video that I'm creating and what you're seeing. So. Um, uh, yeah, if it takes me a second or two to respond to your question, then go for it. All right, we've got one connection in from the Philippines. Okay, well, why don't we get started uh, with the presentation? We've given people a couple minutes to file on in and uh, we'll get started. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this is called More Than One Kind of Expert Responses to a Proposed Set of Harm Reduction Campaign Materials by Cannabis Consumers, Bud Tenders, and Cannabis Policy and Public Health Experts. Uh, it's a long title, but it's very descriptive. And so I think it gives you a good sense of what we're talking about. Uh, and I'll get into the methodology shortly. Um, first, though, I just want to make sure that I acknowledge our partners, which were the Canadian Public Health Association and Canadian Students for Sensible Drugs Policy. And this work was funded uh, by the National uh, Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. I know uh, natural sciences and engineering does not sound like the <laughs> funding body you would imagine, but uh, they, uh, they actually were tied into our social science funding streams as well. Uh, they were the ones who just administered the grant. So. Uh, <laughs> one thing that comes with legalization of cannabis is different funding bodies give you money than you might have ever expected before. So there's something to think about with that. Uh, I did also just want to uh, acknowledge that uh, Humber College, where I work, is located on the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, known as Adobe Gook in the place of the Alders. In the Michisagi language, the region is uniquely situated along the Humber River watershed, which has historically provided an integral connection to the Anishinaabe, Hodosanani, and the Wendat peoples between the Ontario Lakeshore and the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bay regions. Now home to people of numerous nations, Adobagok continues to provide a vital source of interconnection for all. You know, we are particularly lucky uh, to be working in this uh, great land and acknowledge its long and, and storied history and peoples uh, who were here before us and uh, continue to be here. Um, and I also, before we get started, I want to make sure that I acknowledge my, uh, my great team that really made this happen. This is a project that was focused on human-centered design uh, and meant that we really needed to engage young people and uh, faculty from diverse areas uh, of knowledge. Uh, you know, I myself have a background in social policy and cannabis, uh, but we brought in Professor Marilyn Cresswell, who has a background in marketing and creative advertising, and my colleague, Dr. Ashley, Ashley Hoskerfield, uh, who has the stats knowledge that uh, powered through this project. But really, I think the most important people on this project are actually our student research assistants. Uh, at Humber College, technically, we're a, a polytechnic, and so we don't have graduate students. Uh, and so all of these students uh, are undergrad students or doing uh, like a one-year certificate uh, post-grad. Um, 
we have had 25 research assistants on the project so far over the last three years and it is their voice that you see in the materials that are designed here today it is their hard work that i think really uh pushed this project forward through several very difficult years so i want to make sure they get uh, acknowledgement so let's jump into what we're talking about today we're going to go over research methods we're going to look at the data we gathered from our first round of data collection we're then going to go into uh, the themes that emerged from our second round of focus groups we're then going to examine the materials that were eventually created and distributed and then we're going to think about what comes next so all the characters that you're seeing here by the way these are all some of our final characters um, and I'll, you'll sort of see the evolution to them in our draft campaign materials so <clears throat> what would this project actually all about so the heart of this project is the idea that drugs education is pretty crap let's be frank um, it is focused on stigmatizing it is focused on fear and we wanted to try and do something different <clears throat> so what we did is we created a human-centered design approach to through a multi-methods uh it's a sorry, mixed methods uh project uh, to talk to cannabis consumers and understand what data they already have about cannabis, where they're getting information about cannabis, uh, who they want to be delivering information about cannabis so that we could actually create a better set of public education materials. That was our, our goal from the very beginning. This is an applied research project. So we talked to Canadians who consume cannabis and who are between 18 and 30 years of age. We had about 1,600 responses to our survey uh, in total. Uh, once you actually get down to it, I think some of our questions had more like 900 uh, to 1,000 responses, uh, depending on the question and you know how, uh, how it was answered. Um, but then we also conducted a first round of 10 focus groups that had 82 participants. And after we did all of this initial data collection, we took our materials, we did a very quick analysis of it, and we gave all of the data to students in the Bachelor of Creative Advertising program at our college. And as part of an assignment in their one of their courses, a third year course, they created nine different uh, draft campaign ideas. And I'd have to say, I think out of the nine that we saw, I, I would have gone with seven of them. Uh, I think they really, you know, had a good idea and listened to the um, the data and responded well. What we did to narrow it down a bit after that was we had a panel of uh, consumers and industry experts and public health experts and marketing experts uh, rate the presentations, and uh, we actually awarded prizes to the students um, and compensated them for their work. And we picked the top three, and so the materials you're going to see today are from the top three selections that we made uh, from the nine that were submitted. And the data that you're going to see, the responses, are from a second round of focus groups that we then conducted. And we did six focus groups, two with cannabis consumers, two with bud tenders, and two with public health and cannabis experts. And in each of these uh, focus groups in the second round, we asked them, okay, here are these draft campaign materials. Uh, what do you see in them? Are, are they scientifically accurate in your mind? Are they engaging? Uh, is there stigma? Is, you know, what are you seeing in here? Does this resonate with you? And that's what we're going to be going over today. So from our first round of data, we identified three major themes. The first is that social media is where most of our consumers were getting their information about cannabis. They were also sometimes going to blogs um, or specialist websites, but they were taking in a lot of information from social media. They didn't trust a lot of this information. There was a lot of skepticism around it, but that's where they were getting their information. They wanted to verify information, though. Uh, the problem was they would get information in that seemed a bit off, or maybe they weren't sure about. Maybe it was coming from a producer or a person they didn't trust, and they wanted to verify it but they were having difficulty doing that. One of the resources that was available to them, bud tenders who sell cannabis in retail, uh, licensed retail shops in Canada, uh, they didn't trust them that much, but they wanted them to be better sources of information than they currently felt them to be. So there was this tension there. There's a group of people who have a bit of trust and seem to have a bit of knowledge, but the respondents wanted them to have better knowledge and be more trusted. 
uh, which is an interesting situation to find yourself in saying like, we want these people to be more trusted and we're the ones who are saying we don't have that much trust in them right now. We also identified that the needs of information varied considerably between uh, infrequent cannabis consumers and frequent cannabis consumers. We thought there would actually be differentiation based on age, uh, but what we identified that it re really came down to how frequently you were consuming. Um, you needed different information. You also had different levels of knowledge, um, particularly if you were a medical cannabis consumer with medical documentation. Those consumers uh, had the highest levels of knowledge and needed the least amount of information in terms of, you know, what is sativa, what is THC. What they really needed information on was very different issues like uh, maintaining cleanliness of cleaning equipment. They needed information on, uh, you know, signs of cannabis dependence, which, as you may be aware, you know, looking at signs of cannabis uh, dependence, uh, you know, that can mirror what simply medical consumption patterns look like. And so it uh, needs to be nuanced and detailed and clear for that specific community. Uh, and also, by the way, feel free to jump in with any questions at any point. I'm happy to, to stop and just have a bit more of a discussion. So uh, moving into the second round of data collection, when we actually showed our uh, draft campaign ideas to people, uh, I'm going to focus on the three different groups individually. So when we first talked to cannabis consumers in the first two uh, focus groups of the second round, we found that they really liked images that were generic, that were non-discriminatory in nature, they liked uh, interactive components, and so there were quizzes, there was online content that you could do polls with, things like that. And they liked that the text was easily read. Uh, we had all of our material um, assessed by our uh, accessibilities office at our college to make sure that it complied with all Canadian laws and best practices. Um, and the, the respondents really liked that. Even those I mean, who, who weren't necessarily visually impaired or or needed to have compliant uh, reading materials like that, liked the fact that it felt easy to read. There was real design um, consideration put into the creation of the materials so that they were easy to take in the information. Uh, you'll notice the slides, like if you're thinking, oh, these slides are also really nice to look. Yeah, that's because I didn't make them, right? Like I may have put the content in and worked with my research assistants on, on writing body content, uh, but we have a graphic design student who actually makes our materials. And I think it's really important uh, that you have good designers on your team, not just good uh, you know, sociologists or drugs policy experts or, or things like that. Uh, the things that our respondents did not like was that our initial materials had very few statistics in them. I think this was the result of the fact that the students making them were doing so as part of a class project. They weren't cannabis experts. You know, they had a relatively short timeline. Uh, so they kind of stuck with the material that we had given them in terms of themes and, and some data from us, but they did, hadn't accessed outside statistical information. And many of our respondents wanted that contextualizing information. Uh, they also didn't like it when we focused on cannabis myths as the lead into the discussion. And you'll, you'll notice that the title of the campaign was called Weed Out Misinformation. We do focus on myths in the campaign overall, but the distinction was that um, they did not like myths as the leading uh, language. And I'll show you in a, a couple of examples in just a moment. Um, and uh, they didn't like the fact that bud tenders weren't um, being utilized effectively as the dissemination pathway for the materials. They wanted these to be uh, focused on uh, sort of a connection point with their retail experience. <clears throat> so I'll show you a couple examples that we showed to consumers. So this is a quote, and these are mock-ups of what the campaign would look like uh, on social media. But when we showed this to a consumer, he said, um, it feels dismissive more than the other campaign, where I think with this one, it's more like you're the idiot who thinks that this like it's a little more like personally dismissive and like like i haven't heard that eating raw cannabis can get you high like you know what i mean um amidst the likes there and we we don't edit for for clarity but we keep everything in as uh you know, sort of naturalistic um i think what he's what he's saying there really is that um by focusing on the myth side of things and myths that are sort of easily understood to be false potentially um that it's dismissive. It says like, you're too dumb to know that this is a myth. Uh, so they liked understanding what myths were. In fact, you know, one of the things that we constantly get feedback on from people is 
the content that we have that says, if you're coughing, that's not a good sign. That's not going to get you higher. If you're holding in the smoke, it's not going to get you higher. Uh, and people are like, whoa, I didn't know that. Like, I thought you were supposed to hold in uh, the smoke. That would get you higher. So they like having that information, but it's about how you present the myths to them. And starting strong like this with the, have you heard that raw cannabis can get you high? Weed is harmless because it's natural. Leading off with these myths uh, really um, actually backfired. This one was uh, received the, the harshest criticism. And the poster that was created that says, Paul, your real estate agent that makes more in one week than you do in one year, spends his evenings and weekends relaxing with his oil pen. The poster was designed to do two things according to the, the student team that made it. It was supposed to say one, look, it's normal that people consume cannabis. Uh, you know, this isn't a stigmatized thing. You know, everybody across society um, you know, could be a cannabis consumer, right? In Canada, we're looking at, you know, roughly 25% of people smoking cannabis in the last year, uh, potentially higher numbers than that. Um, and a, a very significant proportion of the population having smoked previously, but not continuing to. And so the normalization idea was there to help reduce stigma. And the focus on the oil pen was designed uh, to help highlight non-combustion forms of cannabis consumption uh, for frequent consumers. But this poster received a ton of pushback. Every single person hated it. Um, and they said, uh, one of the quotes we like is, 100%, if I see that, that being the poster, I would be like, yo, fuck off, honestly. Like, why are you? Why do you have to say that he makes more in one week than I do in a year? People found it incredibly uh, stigmatizing, off-putting, offensive, uh, and was panned, um, as I said, uh, universally across people who saw it. And um, I think it just highlights that, uh, you know, even well-intentioned individuals, right? The, the students that made this um, wanted to convey a positive message um, and it missed the mark. And so I think being really conscious of what you're saying or implying uh, really can impact the response that people have. When we talk to the bud tenders, and bud tenders again are people who sell cannabis in uh, retail shops in Canada. Uh, there are many licensed and legal retail shops. Some illicit ones do still exist, um, but they're harder and harder to find as they get cracked down on. Um, the bud tenders, um, they wanted to see how the materials could make their jobs easier. Uh, it was important to them that the materials synced up with the kind of discussions they were having with consumers. Um, and they had to be very careful about what they said due to legal restrictions in excuse me, in the Cannabis Act and then in their provincial legislation that uh, regulated retail sales. Uh, so they, for example, a bud tender can't talk about potential benefits or uh, how cannabis might deal with certain health issues. That's illegal for them to do. Uh, and they can get into very serious trouble if they do that. So they wanted to make sure that the materials were uh, safe and legal to use in the stores, but also sort of came right up to the edge of what could be discussed and potentially even move beyond it into areas that they as bud tenders couldn't talk about but public education materials might be able to. Uh, our general counsel at the college did look over our materials uh, to make sure that they complied with the law and we've been given a thumbs up. Um, and one of the big challenges that the bud tenders face is uh, there's not a lot of training. Right? It's, it's a minimum wage job for the most part here in Canada. Uh, so you're looking at 16, 17 dollars an hour maybe. Um, and so the, they're treated sort of as, you know, regular retail uh, employees, you know, if the same as you were going into, a, you know, a big box store or whatnot. So um, the problem is that while they're delivering very specialized information and need a lot of knowledge about cannabis, um, they're often not paid in accordance with that level of knowledge or continually trained. Uh, you might get a cannabis producer coming in and providing some samples or some talking points. Uh, but they're not really being trained on cannabis science and harm reduction there. So they're either doing that on their own or they're not getting it at all uh, in most situations. And, you know, several of the large producers did have like cannabis science training material for bud tenders, uh, but those have largely been shut down as the cannabis companies deal with profitability issues there and they, you know, cut down on their corporate social responsibility side of things. The bud tenders also... Uh, noted the value of positive language in the materials, um, and they didn't want to be um, uh, necessarily highlighting the myths in the first view. And the bud tenders also really wanted to see materials that could be easy to read, could be in the stores, 
you know, many of the stores have large digital displays where they're displaying a menu or you know uh, events that are ongoing. Uh, and the bud tenders viewed uh, the posters we created as potentially something that would come in and take a place in the store and live in the store. So I'll show you a couple uh, quotes here and, and then some other materials. Um, uh, you know, this bud tender was talking about how people come in and they're, you know, they're often looking for high THC products and, you know, they get home and he said, but, you know, when you go home and realize that maybe this isn't what you were looking for, here's something to read up on THC, why the high potency isn't necessarily going to be actually what you're looking for. Uh, and the idea being that you know, people come in with an expectation of something and they might leave and realize that their ideas about cannabis were wrong or they want something different. And at that point, they're not with the bud tender. But if they have something from a bud tender and they trust the bud tender, then that is a good opportunity to um, uh, uh, utilize some of those materials and get them back into the store. So the bud tenders were thinking about it potentially not just as harm reduction, but as a way of showing like, hey, this is a good store to come to. Um, uh, uh, this one uh, was another great quote, but trying to convince a retail environment to hang something negative about the product they're selling is probably going to be quite difficult. Um, and you can see in this, this is from uh, the campaign idea called Weed Splainers, which I love because of the great uh, images they use. They, they turned people into smoking devices. And the Weed Splainers were supposed to be these, you know, uh, cannabis consumers who would tell you all this stuff and didn't actually know what they were talking about. Uh, and it said, Weed Splainers will tell you that bongs are safer than joints. And it's like, nope, bongs have no benefit in reducing the already low harms associated with cannabis smoking. Uh, and the, uh, <laughs> the bartender was like, no one's going to put that in there, right? Like, they're not going to want that kind of messaging in their store. Um, oops, there we go. Uh, when we talked to the cannabis professionals, um, a lot of them were concerned about the language being too academic in nature. And I pointed out to them that the language had actually been written uh, by young people. Um, and the, the academics and the public health people wanted to have it sound even more like it was created in their minds like a young person. Um, and this was interesting because as I said, it already had been written by a young person, but it had been written by young people who wanted and saw data that said, hey, we want to be spoken to with intelligence and with evidence and information. And the professionals were actually the ones that wanted to tone it down a notch. I was gonna say dumb it down, but that's not really the right thing. They didn't wanna dumb it down. They wanted to make it have sort of looser less formal language. And I think about this as the, the meme with Steve Buscemi uh, when he was you know, in his 50s or 60s pretending to be a, uh, a college or high school student. Uh, it's a great meme from that where he walks into the high school you know, carrying a skateboard and he says, how do you do fellow kids? And uh, it, it sort of seemed like a situation uh, that we were mirroring there. And I'll give you an example here. Um, you know, the poster, this is another of the weed splainers one said, Weed splainers will tell you all types of consumption have the same effect duration. Nope. And the the professional said, uh, and then I think just like really initially quickly, like reading that first like sentence you have there, the language is still very like academic, especially when you say like the same effect duration. I don't think people will know what you mean by that. And I, first of all, I, I think the fact that the um, the professional that we spoke to had this a similar number of likes as the uh, the young and uh, you know twenty year old cannabis consumer. Uh, I, th I thought that was quite funny when, they, especially when they were complaining about language. Um, but yeah, they thought that this was too technical or too uh, formal for young people. So what did we actually end up with? Well, we ended up creating uh, the Weed Out Misinformation campaign, um, and we call it a resource for informed cannabis consumption. We talk about it as being a harm reduction and benefit maximization tool. And you can see here some of the characters that we created uh, as part of the campaign. We call these archetypes, and each archetype has a background story. So, for example, the guy on the bike is a bit of a hipster, you know, a bit of like a craft cannabis uh, enthusiast. So he's thinking about ways of consuming cannabis the most naturally and the most flavorfully, um, uh, and also ways that don't, you know, without without uh, being supposed to harm. Uh, the woman here likes outdoor activities and edibles, so she's all about teaching people about start low, go slow. This uh, individual in the middle with the dog is a medical cannabis consumer, so his needs are different than some of the others. Uh, the woman in the green dress there is uh, a barista who's getting, uh, who might is interested in consuming cannabis soon and is wanting to learn more about cannabis. And so for her, we created a first-time checklist that new cannabis consumers can think about. Uh, and we talk about things like set and setting, um, 
you know, how you can keep yourself safe. Uh, this kind of alien looking dude is a bud tender. And then this individual on the left is a nurse practitioner uh, because we identified that people didn't want to be talking to their physicians. They were looking for medical information from others. Um, <clears throat> we also then brought in uh, some cannabis experts to record short videos responding to specific questions. And so the written content is all written and created by young people. Uh, but then we have experts uh, who uh, answer questions and do so with one to two minute videos. And this way we balance the needs of consumers who wanted experts talking to them, but with language potentially uh, that's more approachable. You can also see we set up some activities and quizzes there. And then this is a couple of examples of the materials that we've created for in-store use. So this is our pamphlet. Uh, this one is for expert cannabis consumers. You can see it's called Cannabis Consumption for Weed Whizzes. Uh, it talks about things like keeping your smoking devices clean, using non-combustion forms, uh, signs of cannabis use disorder, uh, things like that. And then you can see the poster here. Uh, what do you do if you've had too many cannabis gummies? And this woman, the archetype is that she's the cool aunt. Um, and um, she, you know, she can give you advice that sort of only a cool aunt could do. Um, and so what do we go from here? What do we do with it? You know, I've got a couple minutes here. I think the keys that we've taken away from this are that positivity uh, is really important, that the voice needs to come from peers. Uh, you know, obviously we had academics working on this project, but as I said, the materials were largely created by young people and uh, I was there to uh, ensure scientific accuracy in the language and, and provide support and guidance. Um, we also need to make sure that we're bringing um, bud tenders into the conversation, but that we understand their capacities, right? They are there to sell a product in a commercial legal cannabis environment. Uh, if we had cannabis social clubs or a different model, it might be different, um, but they have you know, quite strict legal requirements. They have sales issues. They have you know, training issues. And so getting them on side and, and in, in our uh, distribution plan is important, but it's also challenging. Uh, you know, I was speaking to someone who represents a bud tenders um, uh, organization, not a union, but it's like an organization of uh, bud tenders that, you know, train, trade information and whatnot. And she was saying, like, where do you want them to do this? How much time do you want them to take? Like, they're, they don't have the time and capacity to take this on. You're asking a lot of them uh, and you need to make sure that you're, you're finding a better way. Um, and so, yeah, so that is uh, sort of the, the big takeaways from there. Where do we go from here? Well, I mean, I think the future is uh, harm reduction focused. I think it's harm reduction led. And it's nice to see that products like this, these, you know, these materials uh, are starting to be taken up in some stores. Uh, we're getting good feedback from them. We're about to launch our formal evaluation plan. Uh, but I think that continuing to shift the paradigm towards a harm reduction centered approach, uh, even with legalized products, is really important. You know, it's it's one thing to talk about harm reduction when you're talking about opiates, which can kill you. Um, you know, people kind of get that message. I think sometimes, well, unfortunately, not everybody, but um, I think it's you know it, it's a much easier to send that message of like, hey, here's ways that we can prevent people from dying. Um, it is very hard to talk about cannabis because cannabis is minimally harmful, right? But plenty of people do develop issues with it uh, when you have legal access. You do need to ensure that you're you know providing a public health approach. Uh, that protects people. And so finding that right balance between, um, you know, uh, clear and nuanced discussions of cannabis without becoming fearful and stigmatizing, which I think a lot of stuff is, um, is challenging. And so we wanted to find a way to provide evidence-informed information that gives people the harm reduction tools and processes they can apply to it. Um, and it's it's a very tight thing to navigate. Um, so I've got about a minute more here. Uh, here's my contact information. What, the students were very nice and made one of the archetypes look like me. This is not surprisingly the professor character. Um, and if you can see his books say, start low, go slow. Um, and so uh, it's a very flattering portrayal of me and I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, that's the, the work we did. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type it in the chat and be happy to, uh, uh, to answer any. So thank you so much.
Okay, well, uh, I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up here. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, this video will be posted uh, for viewing at a later stage by people. So uh, if you do have any questions uh, at that time, I'd be happy to uh, respond to emails or I think there's gonna be a chat function during the replay opportunity. So uh, again, thank you so much for listening and uh, do let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much.